in order to be possible for people to have like, okay, this is an idea of how I can incorporate some crypto powered element to my product. I think that's the thing the space has really been lacking. To try anything, you have to have so much conviction. Like there's this new technology, maybe I don't even really understand it, but like I'm going to pivot to being a blockchain game or a tokenized asset rather than like, this is just one part of the development stack or one piece of utility that I can bring in. And I think great things get built, especially with new technology, not someone knowing like, this is exactly what this is good for. But by trying a thousand things and seeing what sticks and what doesn't. This episode is brought to you by Das London, Blockworks number one institutional crypto conference where all the top institutions and people in crypto are gonna be this March in London, what's becoming maybe the crypto hub of the world. I have a link in the show notes where you can learn more and also a discount code that will get you 20% off. So click the link, find out more and I'll see you there. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we're joined by Sam and Evan from Mists and Labs, who are the creators of SUI, the L1 blockchain. Guys, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Yeah. Yeah, pumped to have you on. Um, Sam, I was doing some creeping to get ready for this episode. I wanted your LinkedIn to see when you started SUI. And I saw that that was in November 2021, which is the absolute peak of the last bull market. So from like an outsider's perspective, I could see why, you know, two people would come together and start a new blockchain in L1 at the hype. Um, but I don't think you did it just because you saw that the market was pumping and it was an opportunity to start in L1. So I'm curious, like what, what is kind of the history there? What is the gap that you saw in the market and why you want to start Sui? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so for us to write it didn't have anything to do with the bull market. Uh, both Ed and I and myself were on the Libra team at Facebook. So we were both on the team since 2018 and working on this Facebook project of trying to build um, global blockchain powered compliant payments network. And so the our roles there was uh, I was the creator of the move language, the lead on um, the designing move, implementing move, integrating into the Libra blockchain. And Evan led a research team that I was on and several other folks were on. So in what we were doing, we did a lot of the design and implementation behind Libra. And then, you know, as the engineering on Libra was basically done, we were doing a lot of work and like looking at limitations that we discovered in the process of building Libra in the first place. How do we scale Libra beyond a single box? How do we lower the latency of Libra? How do we do more advanced smart contract programming than the sort of restrictive stuff that we were going to allow in Libra? And so we basically had this entire playbook for the next generation version of Libra, you know, narwhal consensus, uh, a more advanced version of Move, a lot of cryptographic primitives that weren't included in Libra. And at the same time, like Libra itself was stalling. Like there were a lot of reasons that it wasn't able to get out the door. None of them had anything to do with the tech. Uh, and so at that point, like, and we had a lot of false starts on that. And so at that point, like 2021, we we're sort of like, well, it seems like we have a lot of conviction in Libra. We'd like to see it go out, but it seems like that's never going to happen. We have the technical playbook for the next generation version of this. Like uh, we see that we see that a lot of folks need what we would like to build. Like, let's give it a shot. Yeah, yeah. For me, for me, right. The the writing is being on the wall for a while. Oh, this is not where my destination destiny was. Right. I mean, I was very excited uh, to be leading research for the uh, Libra project. But like, if you look at my background, like I was building developer platforms, I building products. Right. I I'm a PhD dropout, and there were published papers. Uh, you know, research was not my thing. I always wanted to do something bigger than what Libra was. And so it's back, been back in my head for a while. Uh, you know, how do we take something from building a blockchain to an actual developer platform for, for products? Uh, and what does product uh, folks need? Uh, you know, the timing was just opportunity. You know, it was a good opportunity, right? And as so Libra was starting to wind down, it was a good time for me to come out and do my own thing it's i don't even remember if it was full market or not it's it's two years it's a long time yeah mm -hmm. so sam you just nonchalantly mentioned uh you created move uh but uh that actually reminds me i i think i tweeted something like list all the programming languages you've learned in order and i believe evan you replied to it this was a while ago and you said you like listed like a few languages that you helped create. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty big flex. Um, and, and so I, I am curious, um, was it like a Brandon Ike in JavaScript kind of story where you guys like created this thing in a sprint or was it like a very long and arduous process where you were like very careful with the design choices? Like what was the story of the language itself and how you wrote it? Yeah, great question. So it was somewhere in between. Like when I joined the Libra project, uh, you know, the at the beginning, this the Facebook was sort of pulling in experts from various areas. Like there's a distributed systems expert, there was um, a databases expert, there's a cryptography expert, and I was sort of the languages expert. And the mandate wasn't create a new programming language. It was 
hey, Libra is going to be the smart contracts platform. Uh, you have sort of carbon launch, like take a look what's out there. Like you can take EVM and Solidity as is. You can try to build tooling around it to make it better. Maybe you build a new source language for the EVM that's better. Maybe you repurpose Wasm. Maybe you repurpose the JVM or some other existing um, uh, bytecode and build a language around it. Or maybe you build something from scratch. So basically spent a couple of months like really carefully studying Solidity and the EVM and just trying to see like, okay, you know, what, what are these smart contract things? Like what are developers trying to do? Uh, like what's the, what's the limits of, um, you know, what kind of programs are they trying to write? How is it like conventional programming? How is it different? Where are the places where the language is getting in their way and where's the places where the language is helping them? And so from that exploration, like we looked at uh, all the different um, uh, paths that I described in depth. What we ended up determining, what we ended up thinking is like, look, the smart contracts thing, it's a, these languages are a lot more like a DSL than like a general purpose programming language. Like they only do, they only do a couple of things. Like you're going to create objects, you're going to transfer and share them, you're going to do access control checks, and you're not going to do so much more. You know, you're not going to be writing a compiler, you're not going to be writing an operating system, uh, you're not doing file I.O. You really want your core abstractions to be focused around these smart contract programming tasks, and then you want those abstractions to be safe, and you want everything else to work outward from that. And so when we looked at achieving that goal by, you know, trying to bolt stuff on top of the EVM around Solidity or on trying to take a general purpose bytecode like Wasm and trying to make it uh, into something that it wasn't designed for. What we end up thinking is like, look, like, let's just design, like, we're very early in this whole smart contracts and crypto thing. Like, let's just design something from scratch that has exactly the properties we want. And so with Move, we started with the bytecode. We worked on uh, having the verifier that checked all these things we wanted. Memory, sa memory safety, type safety, you know, resource safety, having this concept of objects or assets that you just pass back and forth between functions uh, in a very ergonomic way. And then the story sort of evolved from there. So that's how it went. And of course, we learned a lot by actually implementing lots of example code for Libra and like rewriting Solidity code and move and saying like, you know, one is a nicer, one is a less nice. Um, and that's continued for five years now. That makes sense. I think, so we'll get to how SWE works. And I, I do have some pretty specific questions around like the concurrency and the uh, SCM stuff. Uh, and also about atomic composability. But I am curious, actually, um, you guys created a new language, um, which is, as you said, maybe more similar to DSL anyways, like in, in, in the context of smart contracts. I think my concern personally has never been really maybe the tech of SWE, but more so maybe the go-to-market for capturing new developers, right? So I'm curious at, like, at Mistin Labs, how do you guys think about the go-to-market for getting developers, getting them to use this, um, and entrenching them or just, just cultivating this ecosystem of, of move? Yeah, so I think the biggest, the biggest thing we think about in developer acquisition is what's the prize for a developer? If I build something compelling, how many people are going to use it? Like, you know, sort of what's my total addressable market as a developer? And if you look across crypto today, like the, the number I anchor this on is wallet installs. Like there's maybe 60 million wallet installs across all of crypto. This isn't just Solana or just Ethereum, you know, this is everything. And so if you build something and it's really, really great, that's the maximum number of people that are going to use it. 60 million probably. Maybe some people will install a wallet just to use your app. I think typically that's not the case. Like we all know the, the UX hurdles in terms of key management, in terms of installing this weird browser plugin, uh, in terms of like dealing with a the loss. These are, these are all pretty great. And so we think about, okay. And then the other hurdle, uh, of course, is that, you know, you're sending transactions on a blockchain. You have to pay for those transactions with the native token. And so how are you going to get those tokens? You go to Coinbase, you go to your favorite exchange, you're scanning your passport, you're waiting, you know, you're doing whatever you have to do. So these are just immense barriers to, to, to building anything. And so what we think about is like, okay, like, of course, you got to have scalability, you got to have the good developer experience, you got to have security. But really the thing you, you need the most is you need a motivation for someone to build something because they're going to reach a large audience because they can expect, they, they, they can have an app that can go truly viral. And so that's really what we think about with Suite and our developer acquisition strategy is how can we build, how can we turn these problems into technical problems and then build the, build features in the platform that can get rid of the summities. So I think our flagship in terms of this is ZK Login, or the ZK stands for Zero Knowledge, which is a way that it's a native authenticate. Uh, suite has cryptographic agility, so you can sign transactions with all sorts of different key types, and one key type is ZK Login, where you can send transactions from a Google account, you know, from a Facebook account, from an Apple account. We support a variety of different login providers, and you can do that. You can have a self-custodial experience where the, uh, there's no key that uh, you're just bootstrapping the existing Web2 login into something that you can send transactions, um, you can sign transactions, you can build apps, all without having to install a wallet or having to deal with that. And then we couple that with sponsored transactions, which is a feature where 
someone else can pay for the gas so you can use more traditional revenue models like ads pay for the gas or maybe the app sort of uh, comps it for the user as part of the as part of their strategy and so these are two specific examples but that's basically how we think about it is like how do we make the how do we make the audience that a developer can build for larger and then how do we do all the things we need to do uh, at a technical level to make that possible and then there's many many other things in terms of like the experience of using Move, the experience of using RPCs and these other finer points, but that's sort of the big picture we think that we're doing differently than others. When you're talking to developers and you want them to come build on your ecosystem, are you largely talking to people that are in Web2? Or are you talking to developers that are already in the crypto? And I think as part of that, you developed Move a couple of years ago, at least just from the little research I saw. It's not something that's like widely used outside of crypto right now. Like Aptos also uses it. Um, whereas Solana has something like Rust, which I think can be more difficult to actually program, but at the same time, it's used by developers kind of outside of crypto in itself. So I'm just curious, like, what is your pitch to get users in um, to start working on Suite? It depends on the audience, right? I mean, when you think about building up a developer platform, uh, there's definitely a large group of Web3 developers that when we pitch to them, like we tend to talk about the merits of the language, but also the platform as a whole. Right. This is perhaps something that's a little bit of a misunderstanding of, you know, in the general blockchain industry. So you don't take a blockchain and add a language on top of it, then you equivalent, right? The whole system has to be designed cohesively, right? Leverage each, you know, sort of design feature and the philosophy of, uh, you know, everything else, right? This is why, you know, the experience of developing on, on Sui is very, very different, say, than Aptos, even though it's both move based chains, right? So uh, for sort of like the bottom-up strategy in terms of crying uh, developers, Web3 native developers, you know, focus on the pain points, right? Is a kind of a develop, the, the experience of the language or the APIs and all that, you know, are they, are they fine, right? And although the overall chain experience or is it more about security concerns or gas or any or scalability, any of that sort of thing. But we also talk to a lot of like larger product builder. You know, I wouldn't say they have much of opinions about Web3. Typically, they just want to solve problems, right? So for us, right, when we talk to these partners in these larger development shops or companies, enterprises, it's understanding what problem they're trying to solve and provide them with solutions. But frankly, right, if you think about how large scale applications are developed. They don't necessarily stop using a particular language. They're, it's typically building on a lot of different solutions already available on the market, right? There's a very, very few company that have the capacity, the ability to go out and sort of build a stack on the bottom up. Uh, so it's, it really depends on who we're talking to and the approach can be quite different. Yeah. And to touch on the question you asked about Rust specifically, this particular thing is somewhat of a pet peeve of mine because, you know, I think folks say like, oh, you know, if I just use JavaScript in my blockchain or use Rust in my blockchain, then instantly, like, I get the entire developer communities of those languages. Well, that's not the case. Like, you know, let's take Rust, for example. I'm not picking on Rust. It's a great language. I, I code in it all the time. Like, that's what Move is implemented in. That's what Sui is implemented in. I used it long before Libra. You know, we were talking about smart contracts. Like, the fundamental thing, the fundamental thing you're doing is creating assets. Okay, Rust doesn't have a built-in notion of an asset. You're transferring them. There's no built-in notion of transferring. You have accounts. There's no built-in notion of that either. And so, like these fundamental things that you're doing, they all have to be added on in terms of libraries. And although the language itself is familiar, and you know the the IDE is familiar, the build system is familiar, these sorts of things, like the programming experience and the core abstractions have to be bolted on with libraries. And there are certain corners of the language that you're not allowed to go into if you're writing smart contracts, but you could if you were writing normal Rust. So I think these things help to an extent. I think it makes it a little bit easier to to get started because you don't start off by, say, installing a VS Code plugin for some unfamiliar language. But I think in the long term, really focusing around like the task at hand, which is very, very different than what conventional languages are trying to do, does actually provide a big benefit for, for developers and for writing things that are simple and secure. Yeah, good point. Um, I do have some thoughts on that, but in the, in the interest of time, because I have so many questions, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just kind of keep firing away. Um, so I want to do a quick crash course, right? Because we have a lot of investors and developers and founders, primarily probably from Solana, but also maybe from Ethereum. And I want you guys to explain what makes, how to think about Sui in terms of a mental model. So in the way I'll frame that is like, everybody knows the EVM, single-threaded runtime. Um, you know, they 
strongly believe in lower hardware requirements, and then maybe you're going to scale up your L2s and dang sharding with the DA, but then maybe alt DA is going forward. And then we have Solana, right, uh, where everything is done in an integrated, integrated way uh, using the SVM, more parallelization, and then there's SWE. So maybe can you, with that framework in mind, can you explain how SWE I, first achieves performance and scalability? In a lot of way, I think, you know, this whole blockchain space, there's too much focus on all the complexity of the underlying technology, right? This is the only time when you're thinking about using technology, you have to be very, very keenly aware of the, the different scaling strategy, right? Or you're asking product builder to say, well, you, you probably have to use different components that, you know, best suits your needs, right? You can have to, you know, think about, you know, an L2, you have to think about a sequencer, you have to think about a sediment layer and all that sort of thing. This is in a lot of ways nuts, right? So if from the high level, right, when, what we want people to think about when we think about three years, it's a platform where a lot of these things that you are concerned about with other blockchains are just table state. You don't really think about scaling. You don't think about performance. You don't think about gas stability. They just work. Uh, then the focus on how can we enable to solve the problems. Uh, same that you can talk to the rest. Yes, yeah, sure thing. I mean, so I'll well, first position with respect to the platforms that you mentioned, and then maybe sort of uh, tell the story more from the ground up. So, right. So, SWE is a smart contract platform uh, powered by Move. It's designed around the goals of ultra low, late, ultra low latency and horizontal scalability. Uh, the thing it's doing differently, um, uh, I'd say for most other platforms, is that we're starting from a data model that's oriented around objects instead of around accounts. Let's look at Solana or Ethereum. Uh, and these are with their different meta ways, but in the data model, they're similar. Like everything is based on accounts, right? Like you have an account, um, and if you have, and if you have coins, if you have NFTs, the way you represent ownership is there's a large hash table. In this hash table, there are keys that are addresses and in the, the values in the hash table are integer values that represent balances or their bytes that represent an NFT or whatever thing it is that you're talking about. Um, when you send a transaction, you know, you're the, it has an owner. Uh, that owner, usually the code is written in such a way that you're, that owner is only allowed to do certain things, but they're entering the hash table, you know, maybe they can only deduct from the balance of theirs, so they can increment the balance of anyone else's, these sorts of things. That's the basic sort of like data and, and programming model. In SWE, in, in SWE, the global storage looks different. It's a set of objects. These objects have global unique IDs. You can think of it a map from object ID to object bytes. And then in the object bytes, there's some native metadata. So the native metadata includes an owner field, so the owner could be an address, it could be the ID of another object, or it could be uh, immutable, which is how you represent smart contracts, or it can be shared, which means like there's an object that's not owned by anybody, uh, anyone's allowed to touch it. And this is how you represent something like a DEX or an auction or any of these things where you allow multiple folks to touch at the same time. So that's that's the basic different view on the of the of the data model, like you know, oriented around accounts, represent ownership of the hash table versus this pool of objects. You have ownership metadata that's embedded within the object itself. You know, just maybe zoom out to like a fourth year university student or like a some sort of VC level understanding of how does SWE get or how does it get its performance that's different from Solana and, and the EVM? Yeah. So let's break performance down into two characteristics. So one is one is about latency. And this is, I think, the thing, uh, something that we're focused on, maybe more than others, where we think having really low latency uh, is, what, is what you have to have if you're going to enable a lot of use cases, something like games. It's very latency sensitive. If you're doing payments or anything with transact or anything with transacting in real life, you care a lot about latency. So we think a lot about, like, how can you take latency and push it to the theoretical limits? And so the main, the main thing that we do there that's different is that in other systems, in the EVM and in Solana, like what happens is you get a bunch of transactions, you have a consensus process that creates a total order among the transactions, and then you execute them. And the execution part in, the, say, in Solana is parallel, in the EVM it's sequential, or in these new parallel EVMs, the, it's sequential. But there's always this bottleneck of like you do the ordering first. And so in SWE, what we observed is, look, like when you look at computations, some of them require ordering uh, beforehand, and some of them don't. And especially, if, and in particular, things like object transfers or payments, they actually don't require full consensus. Uh, you can get away with a weaker systems primitive called Byzantine system broadcast. And so in SWE, we don't, we have consensus, of course, but we also have a consensus fast path where you can execute transactions 
using this Byzantine system broadcast system without going through full consensus. And that ends up being a lot lower latency because global consensus among hundreds or thousands of validators is going gonna, is gonna to have an overhead that you can't get around. So what that lets us do is that we can have some transactions like payments or transfers that are that have end end latency of 480 milliseconds, which is just a lot better than you're going to do if you have to go through full consensus. And then for consensus, you know, we have all the, the bells and whistles to make that fast as well. What are the final, finality guarantees for that? Like, is that, does that always finalize? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Get, that makes sense. You get optimistic finality in 25 milliseconds and you get, uh, you get finality in 400 milliseconds and you get end to end latency in 480. Okay, cool. So that's that's the first uh, vector we're looking at for scalability. And what was the other one? Yeah, so that that's the low latency story. And then, of course, like, you know, through, then we're going to talk about throughput. You know, you uh, we won't be able to process a lot of transactions. Uh, you know, this is this is like the most popular topic in the space since you know, 2017 or 2018. And so our story there is a couple of things. So I'd say it's most similar to Solana and that in the data model, you have transactions and a transaction says, like, Here's the objects I'm going to operate on. I'd like to take this object as input because I'm going to transfer it. I'd like to take this auction as input because, you know, I'm going to list something for sale. Uh, I'm going to try to buy something that's there that, and these sorts of things. And so the, the transaction can only touch the objects that are inputs. And so what that lets us do is it makes it very, very easy to do parallel execution, uh, much like Solana with the, the input accounts. Like, you know exactly what's going to be touched. You can have a scheduler that farms out tasks to the appropriate cores, to the appropriate machines, wherever you need to. And you turn things in parallel, and you turn and execute through things in parallel. In addition to that, there's the feedback loop into the into the incentive mechanism. Like you know, I, one of my pet peeves about parallel execution is that people are like, "Ah, oh, I had parallel execution, and now I'm done. Uh, everyone's just going to give me a parallel workload, right?" Uh, but of course, what you need is you need some way in your gas pricing or your incentive system that if you're going to create sequential contention on the same piece of shared state or like a the, hotspots a lot of folks like to talk about, then that's, that should cost more. Uh, and it should also not affect the quality of service for other transactions. So for us, it's very easy to do that because we know the object inputs that are coming in. We can set up the gas pricing scheme such that, you know, gas price goes up on hot objects and stays the same on other objects. Uh, and then so folks are incentivized to send transactions that won't create contention or write code that's not going to create um, sequential contention because it'll just, uh, it'll run faster and it'll... Uh, and it'll stay, and the prices will stay lower as well. Perhaps it's also worth talking about the storage scalability story because it's very, very different from any other blockchains out there. Yeah, sure. So that's a third axis worth mentioning. So I talked about latency. I talked about throughput. And uh, there's one other thing I want to mention on throughput before I, I go on to storage, which is that, okay, yeah, so the this is the parallel execution is a big part of this. Like, you know, we uh, this means you can execute a lot of transactions at once. You have the incentive system to make sure you get a parallel workload. And then importantly, like we don't want this, we don't want this to only be possible on a single box. Like if, or we don't want our throughput to be limited by the largest machine that we can buy or ask our validators to buy. If we need to, we want to be able to farm execution out to different workers. We want to be able to store objects across different workers. Uh, we want to be able to scale elastically uh, up and, you know, add machines because there's a spike of transactions coming in, roll them down once traffic returns to normal and all these sorts of things. And so the object data model is uh, is how we're is how we're uh, able to do this because you have the native ownership information because you have types inside the objects you can shard by owner address you can shard by type you can shard by objects that are frequently used together you can um, this is all under the hood like not part of the protocol so you can change so you can change the scheme you use if the the workload you're looking at uh, shifts under time and so as Evan was mentioning like we care about this for throughput because we want to be able to get more throughput by adding more workers. We also want to be able to show, we also want to be able to scale storage by adding more disks and having the and not having that affect the the throughput of the protocol or affect the latency because we're always having to compute a checkpoint over some Twitter over some global state. And so the way the the object and transaction data model works, we serve authenticated reads by looking at by committing to the results of a transaction and then looking at the validator signatures on a transaction. And showing the reads off of that rather than saying, oh, here's a big global, here's a big global Merkle tree of accounts and do your read off of that. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay. I have a few follow ups, but I'll try to maybe skip some for, for the sake of Garrett. Um, for the first part, um, I'm, I'm curious when you say, because latency is one thing you're optimizing for, right? How does that scale? Just excuse my ignorance, but like as you keep adding more machines, 
how do you like what is the how does that uh, how does that relate to the val- what is the relationship between the validator set size and overall network latency? Yeah, so for this fast path, there's not a strong relationship because the way this the way this I, I didn't go into the details of how this Byzantine consistent broadcast process works, but the way it works is that I have a transaction, you know, say it's a payment for me to Evan that I'd like to send. So what I do as a user is I broadcast that transaction in parallel to all validators, a quorum of validators. It doesn't matter. It has to be at least a quorum. Each validator looks at that transaction, checks that I have the, I have sufficient, you know, this is signed by me. I have sufficient balance, all these sort of pre-transaction checks. And they signed it and send it back to me. And then I, these are VLS signatures. I aggregate these signatures into an artifact we call a certificate. And then that certificate goes back to one or more validators. And that's what actually gets executed. So this, this question of what happens when you have more validators, well, the user is broadcasting to the validators in parallel. So, you know, if you're broadcasting to 100, 150, 500, 1,000, it doesn't matter. The only, the only part of the equation that changes is the BLS signature aggregation and the BLS signature checking. And that basically increases linearly with the number of validators. And that's for both paths, not just the fast path? No, that's just for the fast path. For the other path, uh, you know, we're using... Narwhal consensus, the um, the relationship of its speed with respect to the number of validators, um, okay, is okay. Yeah, is not the same. And um, you you mentioned something interesting there about horizontally scaling, but like elastically spinning up workers. How, can you maybe explain a bit more how that would work? Like, I'm guessing you're spinning up more workers per machine. You're not spinning up new machines, right? No, you could, I mean, you can spin up new machines. Um, and, you know, the, to be clear on this part too, like, you know, this is, this is like the long-term roadmap that we've had, like come up with the architecture such that this will eventually be possible. So we mainnet today runs on a single box architecture. Of course, we, we leverage all the cores and, uh, on the machine, but we think of a worker as a core rather than a logical machine. There's a lot of engineering work that needs to be done to get to this point where you actually farm out tasks to new machines. But I, I do mean like, you know, a new worker machine where you're like, Hey, there's, this worker that has all of the objects uh, of this coin type, and like we're, um, and so when transactions come in, if they're touching this coin type, I send them to this worker. This worker is uh, handling all the things that are that are NFT types, and then if they come in, I send transactions to this to this worker, and then you try to set up the starting scheme, of course, such that you can have all the all the reads and all the writes you need to do on the same machine instead of having to go across and your scalability, uh, or sorry, your throughput depends on how successful you are in doing that isolation. Quick break to tell you about an upcoming event I promise you don't want to miss. It's BlockWorks biggest and best institutional conference called DAS London. It's a two-day event happening in London this March where we're going to have over 700 institutions, 130 speakers, and a couple thousand of us all under one roof. Crypto is in a position for the first time to actually onboard these institutions, and they're showing up. We have companies from BlackRock to Visa launching real products in the space. We have the real-world asset narrative taking off. We have things like payments that have been exponentially growing, and then we have things like deep end happening in the Solana ecosystem. There's a ton of capital right now in this institutional space. It's going to be coming on chain. It's going to completely change the industry. Whether you are an institution or you're a retail user or you just want to learn more about what's going on in the space, this conference is for you. You're going to be able to meet some of the best and smartest people in the space. The speaker lineup is absolutely incredible and you'll get to hang out with me. But the best part is you actually get 20% off your ticket if you use Lightspeed 20 when checking out. That's Lightspeed 20. I put a link in the show notes. Um, I recommend buying this today because one, you'll forget about it. Two, these ticket prices go up every single month. So anyways, I hope to see you there. Now, let's get back to the show. I had a question on the, the validators. Sam, I know this can change over time. Um, and me and Mert definitely aren't under the belief that you should be able to run a, a full node on your phone or on a laptop necessarily or a basic laptop. But I am curious, just what are the, the validator um, requirements from a high level, even like the cost per month? So when we talk about Solana, it's often around $300. I think you can do 300 to 350 And I know if you want to validate in the set, I think you need, yeah, 30 million of SWE, which is like $17.4 million today to join that validating set. So I'm just curious, like how you think about requirements and also um, just what's the ultimate like node validator set that you want? Because I think right now you have around 100 validators. Yeah, so I think the key, the comparable numbers there is it costs about $750 a month to operate a validator and uh, you need 20 and you need 20 million SWE. And so... With these, yeah, like, you know, 20 million SWE at, at this point um, is a high barrier to entry. You know, with these things, like, the, um, it's not that everyone has, like, 20 million SWE of their own funds. Like, when you launch these new networks, you have the SWE Foundation. They have a they have a staking program where it's, like, folks apply to, to receive stake from the SWE Foundation. And then the SWE Foundation makes choices based on, like, you know, we want good geographical distribution. Uh, we want good data center distribution. 
we want to make sure that we're not too much dependent on you know one kind of cloud provider operating system or, the, or and all of these sorts of things. And so like this is something where over time like you put that distribution the people get their own funds, they start with new validators, they compete with the existing validators, the other ones go out, uh, new folks apply in this program the, because they perform better, stake a shift around, and then the validator set grows. We don't, we don't really have a, I mean, right, there's a lot of talk about validator set and like validator set size is like, this is the ultimate metric for decentralization or you have to reach this level or the, or it's not going to count. We're pretty pragmatic, we're pretty pragmatic about this. The, we think the metric that matters the most is basically how much does it cost as a user to replicate the, the transactions that are touching your state and actually doing what you want to do? And our story on that is leveraging this uh, leveraging this object data model to do something that, that we call sparse nodes, where it's like the you can validate just the transactions that are touching your objects, they're touching your state, and you can download and run these very efficiently um, without having to pay the cost of running a full full node or running a full validator. And we think especially like as you get to the point where you know, the validators are processing thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of transactions a second at a very regular rate. Like, it's just not going to be feasible at all for a normal user to do anything except for for track the for tracking the changes to their objects. So, really, like that's I think the thing that we're going to care about the most. That you can always um, you can do the audit trail for what you do, and collectively, uh, if everyone is doing that, then you you have the the verified view of what's going on, and you make sure that validators aren't. Uh, diverging from the protocol or doing things that they're not supposed to do. One thing I am curious about on the parallel execution is how you think about optimistic versus pessimistic parallel execution. I believe Aptos is optimistic, and then we have Monad who's doing optimistic. And I've heard arguments from them that it actually is highly efficient to do so in the sense that even if everything ends up being sequential, it's not much of a hit at all, and it makes it a lot easier for the developers. I'm curious how you think about that. Yeah. It's a great question. So it's it's not an either or. Like in either Solana or in Sui, where you have static information that helps you parallelize, like that doesn't preclude you from also using dynamic techniques after the fact. Like more static information can only be a good thing. Like, you know, we are not doing anything particularly advanced today because the static techniques work very well. But if we wanted to stack dynamic uh, conflict detection on top of that and execute things in parallel, even when the static information tells us they might conflict and, you know, do the rollback, that's something we can do as well. So my feeling on this is that the stat, every system is eventually going to have static information for this reason I sort of alluded to earlier and that it's not enough to just have parallel execution. You have to have incentives for folks to be providing you a parallelizable workload. And if you find out that a conflict happens at runtime because you know you're, you have a, an optimistic technique and you detect that, oh, this is actually creating a conflict, it's too late to charge that transaction a higher gas price or to otherwise punish them for, you know, that's going to be changing the semantics. If you want to do that, you have to be able to detect contention at the static layer by looking at, hey, there's too many, uh, there's too many Solana transactions touching this account. There's a hot spot. There's too many sweep transactions touching this object. There's a hot spot, and then you know, deprioritize it in the transaction processing queue, require a higher gas price, kick it out if there's a limit of transactions that are touching the same object or that sort of thing. So I think that's my high level view is that there's a lot of like, oh, you know, build it and they will come. We build the parallel execution engine. Uh, the, someone's going to give us a parallel workload. But I think you really, really have to work that into the incentives layer. Otherwise, there's just no guarantee that's actually going to happen. And the static view is key to doing that. State growth is a big part of this as well, right? Like you can have parallel execution, but right now the reason why the AVM is so slow and has such low TPS is largely to prevent state growth. So I'm just curious how you think about that right now um, to prevent you know that happening in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we actually want state growth. What you don't want is state growth combined with a need to build an authenticated view of all the state and system. And so we talked earlier about the object data model and how that avoids the need to have a giant Merkle tree with all the objects at the root or all of the accounts at the root. What you want instead is you want to use conventional databases. And so like when you need to do more storage, you uh, provision more disks or you get a machine with bigger hardware. And that's so like the, the overhead of state growth is just your the size of your validator set times the number of bytes instead of some much larger equation that factors in the, the superstructure of a Merkle tree or some other global authenticated data structure that you have to build on top of that. So we don't we don't mind state growth. Our our storage is very, very cheap. I think it's actually a hundred X cheaper than Solana. Now Solana folks are gonna say things about NFT compression and how like that's that's the, the way to get cheaper storage. So, you know, which which fair enough. You know, that's a that's a discussion that we can have as well. We're very comfortable with the state growth because we tried to design things such that like, you know, we 
the storage is cheap in the in the real world and what too, and we can leverage that as much as possible minus the duplication of validator set forces. Gotcha. Mary, I was just going to say you're going to have to respond to that. I am um, c- kind of tangentially. I am curious on maybe your long term view on archival storage, right? Um, like, okay, so the way Solana works, for example, is you have state in the validators, current state, but then the ledger necessarily doesn't have to be on the state. In fact, there's no point. Like the the point is you're having consensus on state n to n plus one. And then with compression, maybe you link those two with, with a Merkle tree. How do you guys, like, let's say you, I don't know, get to like a trillion transactions in some X years. Where's that data stored? Like, how are you going to store it in archive? Yeah, it's very much the same story as Solana, where you know we keep the the account database or the object database in our case uh, on, on the nodes, and you need that information there because any transaction might come in and want to touch it. But of course, for transactions like you know the, that log is ever growing, so you need some form of state pruning. There's no dependency on transaction processing to have the historical log. We had it to make it easier to to sync full nodes to the to the last month or so of transactions or whatever we set that pruning window to. And then there's archival nodes that are run by Sweet Foundation that are run by Nissan that are run by the community who are tasked with having that storage run. I think like Solana is one of the first to encounter this problem that's come up with a variety of solutions over time. Like at first it was just in Google. I think now it's uh, in our weave, maybe in other places. I think um, like you got transaction history and make sure that it can't be destroyed. And I think like we'll be very much following the footsteps of making sure that this is available for someone who wants to do historical audits or analytics, but it's not something that burdens the validators. Yeah. What, one thing I'm interested in is one of the problems is like, so let's say you take some transaction that happened, I don't know, at, at time t equals five. And then how do you guarantee that it was actually a part of uh, the ledger? Like, how do you guarantee that it wasn't tampered with? Do you have any cryptographic um, solutions for that right now or not yet? Yeah, exactly. We do. So we have a system of checkpoints, which uh, it's not, it's similar to a block. It's not exactly the same as a block because it's formed asynchronously. But there's a sequence of checkpoints, like the the auditing, the basically the history of SWE for auditing purposes is checkpoints, each of which commits to the previous checkpoint. And then we have a notion of epoch. An epoch happens 24 hours. And then there's a, a summary of an epoch where you can say, show me all the checkpoints that are included in this epoch. Um, that each of those commits to each other. And then the the epoch summary commits to, to all the checkpoints that are in there. And then, of course, each checkpoint commits to the transactions that were included in it and their order. And so if you're if you're auditing it, you can always... And then the, the other component on this is these are signed by the validator set. You have to reflect validator set changes and uh, state, state weight changes. And so if you're trying to look at some old data, you would basically... If you, if you want to be in the most paranoid mode, you start from Genesis, you walk through all the validator set changes until you get to the, the data that you care about. You check those signatures around there. You grab the epoch summary, you grab the checkpoint, and eventually you get the transaction that's in the checkpoint that you can replay or otherwise inspect. Okay, this one's not related to, to storage, but I am just personally curious. Um, based on kind of, because you guys have obviously seen a lot of prod traffic, um, right, like this isn't theoretical. What, what percentage or maybe ratio of transactions currently take the fast path versus not? 19% take the fast path. On a 10% take the fast path. Okay. And Sam, on that fast path, is that essentially, like if I wanted to send USDC to MERT, that's definitely going to be fast path. But if I'm going to interact with, say, Uniswap contract, if I'm on Ethereum, that would not because you're interacting with a pool and smart contracts. Uniswap would not be, yeah. I mean, basically the way you can think of it is like any time where there's the... there's transactions from multiple parties that are hitting something and there has to be a winner and a loser, then you're going to have to use a shared object. So a Uniswap swap is one version of that. There are some DeFi builders who are building DeFi products that take advantage of the fast path. And there the idea is more like there's an operator uh, and like the, it's sort of like a, a crank in these other DeFi systems where you trust the operator for liveness to keep like processing the transactions that come in, but you don't trust them for integrity, like they can't steal the funds. And then you can do DeFi that's taking, that's taking the fast path into account. But in general, like, you know, if you're building classic uh, Uniswap style DEXs or order books or anything else, then that's going to use a shared object. That uh, that right there sounds a lot like code. They have a, a form of a layer two that's on Solana and they do the same thing for liveness. I do want to touch on one more thing, maybe before talking a little bit more about just building a community, which is the security um, aspect of Move. 
because there have been a lot of um, hacks over the last couple of years, billions of dollars. And Stephen Goldfeather from Arbitrum, he's like, yeah, there's a lot of hacks that are happening over here in Ethereum, but that's not truly just because of the EVM. It's really like, it's not happening on your chain because it's obscurity through unpopularity. He made a comparison to Apple and, and Microsoft, whereas like everyone was like, back, this is say 10 years ago or 20 years ago, people were saying that there was no hacks on Apple on Apple computers. And the reason for that, at least at the time, was largely because all the hackers were just going to Windows because they had the majority of the market share and they hadn't set up their systems to actually attack Apple at that time. So I'm curious like how you think about that and the security that move provides. Yeah, I mean, I think if someone asks you, why is your smart contract language more secure? And you say, because there have been no hacks in it yet, that's a very weak argument. Like there, there's no smart contract language in the world that's gonna stop programmers from writing unsafe code. Uh, no matter what protections are built in, people are gonna find a way to make mistakes like that. That's just not something that can happen. Your arguments have to be based on foundations and they have to be based on here are problems with existing languages that my language or my platform can just take off the table, period, for developers. And like, so for, for Move, like some of those things are like rampancy. This thing is the scourge of Ethereum that's caused many, many problems. Like we saw it just last week with NFT Trader, going back to the DAO attack, many of these things like um, rampancy or like more generally like dynamic dispatch. Like this is a blank check in your program for hackers to admit. And it's very, very, and like, of course, you can take them safely around that, but it's very, very hard to do it. Then there's things like uh, ownership and permission checks like, uh, in smart contract languages, other than other than move, you have to run the stuff manually. When you have native ownership, like, the runtime is checking ownership for you. You can't forget the permission checks or the ownership checks. And so that takes a lot of things off the table. Similar things, with, and this is some Solana specific lesson that they're in, like object serialization, like, you know, um, Data is coming in. You have to make sure you serialize the correct object type. Whereas, like when you have typed objects, like, you have to that's taken care of for you. And so that's really the way we think. Like, you know, I'm very proud of that we haven't had any uh, attacks on suite, any hacks on suite. I hope that will continue for as long as possible. We're pragmatic. Like, these things always happen eventually. I think the argument for why is this better has to be about like here, like here's from a theoretical perspective, like why we designed it not to have problems that exist elsewhere. There's a thing on Solana called Runtime V2 that's going to launch, uh, I believe, in 2024. And it's going to bring Move to Solana. And I know of some other ecosystems are looking to add Move as well. Can you maybe explain from your perspective on how that might be different than what's you know on Sui right now? And Mert, you might have something to add there. And as part of that, as a non-techie, you often hear how even Arbitrum is trying to add different languages that you can use um, with Stylus, for example. How does a compiler... Are there more risks that are coming into that because you're saying that like move can provide all these security guarantees but then does adding a compiler kind of remove those so here's the way i would think of it where i think the the key value proposition of move is that you have this notion of typed objects and that the type safety doesn't just apply to your program and the objects that you declare it also applies to objects that flow into your program or to your objects when they flow into untrusted code and so really like all all not all of the value of move but a significant amount of the value for move comes from the fact that the protections don't just apply to you, they apply to code you interact with and they apply to the bad guys as well. And so if you integrate Move onto Solana, of course, you're still going to have the old account-based system. You're going to have to have a story for in and out between Move and Solana programs. And you're not going to be able to run the verifier, the Move verifier that's ensuring all these nice things that let objects flow across those boundaries on the Solana programs. Um, and maybe you'll be able to do it between Move programs. It sort of depends on the details of whether you declare Move by code directly or whether you're compiling it uh, into uh, EDPF or, or uh, however that's going to work. So I think like it'll be, there'll be parts of it that are nice, but I think like Anchor is also very, like Anchor is also very nice compared to say Rust. And then like it interoperates better with say non, non Anchor written uh, Solana programs. So I think the, you know, love to see moving on to Solana. I'd love to see it going into many of these other systems. But I think like, you really, if you're going to use Move, you really want all the all the smart contracts in your in your system to be using Move, so that you can get those benefits of running the verifier and all of them, and getting those strong assumptions on on all of your code and all of your objects. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a high level example. Back in the day, this is very very early days uh, in tech. Uh, you could write object oriented code in C, right? You can build all these abstractions in C. It like, look like a use point. Void pointer, you know, casting and all this pain, you know, kind of you have to go through. But why would you? It's more likely to make all kinds of mistakes if you try to roll up all these nice abstractions uh, to make your life be easier and better. Uh, when in the sweet move uh, case, right, all these uh, enforcements are building into runtime, you don't have this problem, right? You know, so 
we are excited to see Move being kind of adopted by Solana and then many other, you know, platforms. But it's more than just a language, right? It's it's everything around it. It's a, your data model. It's your kind of a tooling, you know, upstreams and downstream, right? The whole system has come together. So just having a blockchain and attaching a different language to it doesn't really you don't necessarily, you know, sort of replicate the same stack. Uh, you don't get all the benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, before I talk about modularity and atomic composability, which uh, Sam commented on a, a few weeks ago, I do have a question about security, but not on the smart contract side, but maybe it, as a holistic uh, distributed system. Um, there's there's some that believe like eco economic security is kind of like the end all be all, and then there's folks like Anatoly who's like, eh, not really. That's kind of a meme, um, right? And you know, I don't want to talk about the price of the token in any like speculative way, but I am curious how you think about economic security and just holistic security network, and what the role of the token is, uh, or how others should think about it. Yeah, I mean, I think we're probably broadly aligned with Anatoly's viewpoints on this. So, SWE is proof of SWE is proof of stake. Uh, you know, we use stake weighted voting, um, and basically, like the we think of the economic security as like you know how much stake would you have to acquire in order to uh, to cause undesired outcomes in the system? Because we're starting from scratch, we do what all new systems do. Like there are stake subsidies to make sure that there's sufficient stake on day one, so that number isn't like in the thousands or millions. And so, I think there's something like. Eight billion SWE is staked right now. Um, that's pretty good economic security, given that the total supply of SWE is uh, is around ten billion or something. But basically, like I think there's a good enough threshold here, and I think basically, look, you, I haven't seen in a lot of cases where blockchains have been attacked via the economic security angle, and especially not early on. Uh, I think it's something where it's like there are many, many security problems with blockchains, but this isn't the biggest one. I think this really starts to become a problem when. I think at the point where one starts to worry about this, where like someone is someone with the resources to perform an economic security attack um, wants to do it, like it's also the case that your ecosystem is probably grown enough that that attack is becoming more and more expensive. So it's it's something that, of course, we have to uh, to worry about and you know keep an eye on and deal with things like stake subsidies. But I think we're in a pretty good position there. Yeah, I mean, I'll say right right now, if you look at. Um, there is not enough critical mission critical applications running on blockchains today. Uh, if you imagine financial you know, institutions and or governments start using public blockchains for any of the functions, and that completely changes the dynamics, Ch completely changes the equation. Right now, uh, you know, kind of a bad player, you know, kind of actors can attack would attack a, a blockchain, not necessary for financial you know, benefits for their own financial benefit for just for to disrupt uh, kind of a government or, or financial institutions. So I, I think this is only one, you know, sort of factor of the, you know, a very complex, you know, kind of equation. I guess the one other thing I might add is that I feel like economic security attacks are a little bit like the, um, the sort of like wrench attack or these sorts of things where it's like, yeah, like one could do it, like a state actor could buy up $8 billion worth of SWE and like cause a problem. But at the end of the day, social consensus is the ultimate protection. And like, you know, that will hurt the network's reputation that they've done that and done something unexpected. But like what will happen is the the network is like, people aren't going to just say like, oh, well, that's what happened. I'm done with it. Like, you know, from a point before this happened and move on. Now that would be bad for the reputation of the network. No one wants it to happen. But I think like the fact that this is doing something like that doesn't, uh, isn't forever, isn't big reason why folks never try to, or rarely try to mount economic security attacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Evan, you mentioned um, that, I mean, you mentioned reality, which is that there aren't that many mission critical apps in, in crypto right now. Um, I'm going to kind of use a weird segue here, but uh, a few weeks ago, um, Ryan from Bankless, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong on that, Garrett, said something about like the uh, crypto's future being like different kind of rollups in the similar way that there's like a new website for everything. Um, and then you 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 replied and you were like, actually, I think like atomic composability um, is something that's quite, quite critical to blockchains. Can you describe to people who are unfamiliar with those concepts, why atomic composability is, is important and why you believe in it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I think of the utility of a smart contract program, uh, of a smart contract platform as this really simple equation. It's like 
the number of valuable assets you have on the platform times the amount of programmability you have in those assets. And I think the atomic composability aspect is a really key part of the, the programmability because let's say everything is on the same platform. As a developer, I can write code that accesses all the assets, all the building blocks out there. As a user, I can, I can have applications that are using any of those. And I don't have to be aware of any of the implementation details of where those assets live or if I have different latencies for interacting for one versus another, one asset versus another, different security models. That's the, vi that's the vision of Sui. That's the vision of Solana. That was the vision of the original Ethereum. Like, put everything valuable in one place, provide a, to provide a programming model where you can atomically access all of it and don't put any barriers in place. Whereas now, like, I think the, there's a different view where it's like, okay, actually, it's okay to fragment this state. It's okay to spread it across multiple L2s. It's okay to spread it across multiple subchains, how, however you'd like to call it. And then we will... Um, yes, this creates UX issues, but like we'll fix it after the fact. Like we'll hide it under the hood. We'll add user experiences on top of that. We'll, you know, launch on just one. We'll launch on just one chain and pull things across. Whatever. I think you know, I'm I'm a techno optimist. Like I think all these problems can be solved. I'm not going to say that it's impossible, but I think the main thing is like what I would really like is I would like some like let's acknowledge that this is a compromise. Like the ideal the ideal thing to do is to put everything in one place and make that scale and make that be decentralized and make that have all the other characteristics we want rather than cause the fragmentation and try to fix it after the fact. So that, that's really what I was getting at uh, in my post. I was just going to add, I was trying to play around on Cosmos today to make a trade or two, and my God, it was terrible. I, I, they're going to fix it, but I had, to, <laughs> I had to reach out to our research chat, and I'm like, I think my USDC is just stranded here, but it's really just Kepler and like moving between chains was so confusing. And I know, like you said, that'll eventually get abstracted. It's just that's going to take some time. And as you have a new user, like I've been in crypto now for a while, it's going to deter everyone away. And that's really, you see Solana right now with like meme coins are absolutely exploding. And that's when it's just so easy. Like you bridge once or you come straight from a, a sex into there and that's all you have to do. I would say um, just, to, just to play defense on the EVM side, because um, this is just what would happen on Twitter. Um, so let, let's assume that, uh, Sam, your, your model of the world is correct. Um, do you think a single L1 can actually handle that? I mean, we wouldn't be doing things the way we were if we didn't think so. I mean, I think a lot of it depends on... Okay, I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? Like, I think the if an L1 can continue to scale and fit everything on the same layer and provide this experience, like, that's going to really expand the the um, use cases that are possible. That's really going to grow the user base. That's going to make this thing real. And I think if there's a fundamental bottleneck somewhere where, well, you have to start fragmenting state and um, degrading user experience and increasing latency at some point, then you know, so be it. Like, you know, we'll we'll go down that route. But I think there, um, I think how big and important that can be really depends on how much we can push on the technical limits. And then I think like the, um, yeah, I, I just wonder the, I, I think maybe, I think this is maybe one of your points. Like, it's never a bad thing to have more throughput, to have more scalability at the base layer. And then if you run into a, a bottleneck there, like sure, do the fragmentation, do the, do the bridging, figure out what you need to do. But that, that's basically my deal on this. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I personally agree with that, of course, but Again, I'm going to play the other side here just to make it interesting. So let's assume, um, you know, uh, the, the validators are, you know, whatever, adding more cores, making the machines slightly stronger. You've optimized for the software inefficiencies. Um, w some people will say, okay, well, now you've made the network inaccessible to run nodes for, uh, in a sense, and maybe that's kind of a centralizing factor. And maybe they don't care about, you know, the word sufficiently decentralized. They're just that's not how they think. How, how do you how do you think about that? Like the relationship of validator requirements and, and scalability, and and maybe um, uh, to piggyback off of that as well, a very common critique of Solana is the the um, uh, the validators that are actually running this hardware not necessarily being profitable in all cases. How how does we maybe think about that and and sustainability long term? Yeah, I mean, I think there are maybe two different questions. This was like, yeah, how do you deal with someone saying, you know, I, I'm not comfortable with these higher hardware requirements, or I don't want to, I don't want there to be too much gatekeeping in running a node. So I think on that, like, there's you know, some of the Solana thesis, like, you know, more solid hardware gets cheaper, storage gets cheaper, like, computers become more capable at the same price. Like, whether that happens at the same pace as blockchain demand changes, well, that's a different question. But like, that's something where you've always got to force working in your favor to, to mediate this. I think the other thing is that, you know, Computers aren't magic. They're they're very fast. They're very powerful. But you can't prop like you know if you're going to any business that's doing a sort of consumer grade volume of transactions, consumer grade amount of usage. Like 
you need a lot of hardware to run that. There's just no getting around that. that. That's how things work. And so I think like there's a question there of is it more valuable to build something that's going to be able to to have that kind of user base or have that consumer grade experience, or is it more valuable to um, have the lower barrier to of entry for nodes? I think that's something that like each community has to sort of decide on its own. I mean, we I think right now we're we're lucky because we're in a place where we can have both. But I think like you know maybe in the future you get to the point where it's like, well, you know, five like. So it costs seven fifty a month, like maybe two thousand a month is too much, or maybe you know, ten thousand is too much. And it's like, you know, we actually want to throttle back, but we don't care that it's gonna limit some use cases because we think that's too important. But uh I have I wouldn't personally have any priors on that. I think there's a lot of uh there's a wide open space. Uh Evan, I don't know what you're yeah, I, mean, I mean, if you look at the Ethereum's pass, right? I mean the the trade off is is it worth it? Yes, uh anybody can run or no, but the the experience for the users as same say the consumer kind of application, it's just impossible. And even for something as simple as staking, right? For you know the newer chains, staking for proof of stake uh, network like Sui, like Solana, is relatively painless. For Ethereum, it's not a painless experience, right? And this is create another you know sort of effect factor for because of centralization, right? What there's a lot of argument in that space. It's like, is the Lido this kind of service is considered centralization? Uh do they count as a single validator or they count as tens or hundreds of validator? Uh what's the true Nakamoto ratio? You know, is it truly centralized decentralized? Right. What's more decentralized, right? Uh you know, it's about trade off. And we believe you're trading off uh the kind of experience you could build, kind of product experience and build. And that's their terrible trade-off, right? And then one can argue, well, I mean, you know, it's Ethereum, the EVM community has been going for a number of years. There's very, very few, you know, that we can name is like that's approachable by by the by consumers. And if that's not the goal we're going towards too, then you ultimately, you know, you you're just basically limiting yourself uh and what you can possibly uh, the kind of value you can achieve, so so I think that's a, that's a you know kind of important to consider, right? Not be kind of very very maxi about it. I, you know, decentralization just means anybody needs to run their nodes, right? I mean, that's just not reality. Nobody nobody does. That. And Mur, I think your second question was about like this critique in in Solana of like, oh, it costs more to run a node than you make from uh, say income directly from uh, from staking rewards or from transaction fees as a node. So for us, like, yeah, I think that's a question people ask too. But then, like, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of other things to factor in that equation. Like, you know, there's MAV, which is um, income for running a node. Like, hard to quantify this or see how much is extracted. But like, that's one way that things can be offset. In a lot of cases, and of course, you know this. Like, you know, nodes also run RPC providers. Like, they're the fact that you run a node, like, you get access to faster reads, and so like that's your business model. Uh, in other cases, like, there's reasons to run a node because like. You're a, you're a monitor, or like you have some security reason doing it. So I think like I don't know if the long term plan is everyone has to has to break even just on fees. Hopefully that will be the case. But I think like in many cases the, um, there are other reasons to run a node that feeds some side business that you have, and that just increases your investment in the ecosystem as well. So that that's also a good thing. Yeah, on Mert's question earlier about do you think that one chain could essentially handle everything in the future? I think even if that was the case, similar to how we have different countries, like people are just going to have different communities and they're going to be on different chains at the end of the day. So there's plenty of room there. I am curious, though, almost every product, company, et cetera, needs a beachhead. Is there any industry when you're pitching developers that you're looking maybe to to help come to Sweet first to really kick everything off? I, I, think, I think gaming is particularly interesting because gaming industry always kind of experiment with a business model, we experiment with tech, right? So naturally they're they are one of the ones that, that we, you know, we're spending a lot of time with because, you know, they are willing and they're very eager to try new things. Uh, but ultimately, right, when you think about what blockchains are good for, right? It's about assets. As you know, you know it, it's about what you can do with assets, which is core for every kind of commerce product. Um, so, and commerce touches everything. You cannot have a, it's hard to find commerce, you know, any kind of consumer product doesn't have a commerce element to it. Uh, so that's the ultimate goal, right? And that's actually a really good match. Uh, and commerce can be as simple as payment or can be exchange of assets value, can be 
you know, staking is a set of, you know, it's an example of, you know, it's kind of commerce activity, right? You basically are lending out uh, your asset for, for yields. So gaming is really sort of, a, a sort of, you know, the, the gateway drop, so to speak, right? The, the first example of kind of consumer vacation, we believe, will become, you know, kind of, we introduce to the general public what Web3 is about. And, but we're definitely not kind of limiting our focus on just gaming. Let's say I'm a developer and I'm, um, I've already built something on Solana and I'm looking to expand or something. How do I pick between Sui and Aptos? What, what, what is, how do you, because it, it actually does seem to be like some general confusion around like exactly, okay, I mean, they both use Move, right? It's like, is that, what are the main differentiators? Yeah, so I think I would go back to what I was mentioning earlier, where our focus is on like, how do we let developers reach the broadest possible audience? So, you know, if you build on Suite, you're going to have ZK login. That means your users don't need to have a wallet installed in order to try out your app. You're going to have sponsored transactions. That means that you can use these, you can have these different models for monetizing transactions that doesn't acquire folks to acquire tokens. You, if you're someone who's going to be issuing an asset or creating an asset, like, you know, this is like uh, something that a lot of folks are doing. We have standards like kiosk that let you have on cloud royalty enforcement and that work for any objects. They don't restrict the structure that NFTs you can have. We have closed loop tokens, which lets you issue a coin that you can put more control on than a normal coin. Like for a loyalty program, maybe you don't want the coin to be traded. You want to restrict the smart contracts that can be used in and all these sorts of things. So I think like that's the, the high level answer I'd give. I think there's a lot of differences about the, the developer experience and like uh, the way we're using Move versus the way that those folks are using Move, but um, the, I would focus on the higher order bits or do a much longer podcast. <laughs> I, I may get in trouble for this, right? But it's already happened, right? Just look at what's happening uh, three after seven months versus other chains after some, you know, after, after seven months, right? I think the answer is very clear. Um, you know, who are capturing the imagination of the developers? Um, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. I don't, I think this is, you know, part of it is building the community, the momentum, uh, and developers want to go to chains that actually have the momentum. It's that like everybody's building on suite and they're building new kind of experience, right? If you look at just recently, you know, maybe a small thing, maybe it's not for everybody to pay attention, right? You know, our repo racing, uh, the NFT mint, right? It's like hundreds of thousands mints, none then have to attach a wallet, you know? You know, to 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 be able to meet anybody with a Gmail account can do this, right? This is open up new venue and developer coming, right? And this is already happening. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, we don't really talk about after versus three for that reason. And right? we po point to the product experience our partners are able to shift, and and that's how we, you know, you know, in my opinion, you know, a lot of we winning the battle right now. Yeah, Sam, and that, that list of features that you had, I, I know those things exist to some level on Solana and on Ethereum, but is the is the largest difference that SWE enshrines some of these features, which would make it easier on a developer? And and just on that, how do you feel on this whole enshrined roadmap where you bring more and more features in the protocol, which might standardize things and also make it easier for developers versus kind of what Ethereum is doing and just allowing that more of a free market, we'll see what people build? Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, I think the enshrining is super important for the same reason that any standard is important. Like, sure, there, like, there, you might have like what three author things that superficially look similar to what zk login is doing, but the difference there is like you got to go trust some centralized service provider, you got to sign up, you got to pay a monthly fee. Whereas like on Sui, it's like zk login, it's a native feature. Like, you go use it, you're not paying anybody. It's it's secure. It's baked in the protocol. There's no centralized services. There's no third party things at all, except for the web two providers, and that just fits in there. Same with something like sponsor transactions versus say like the way this works in ETH, like sure, there's like a standard for you can have someone else pay for gas, but this is something where it's not supported everywhere. Like each smart contract has to opt in to be able to like, oh, I support sponsor transactions, like I support this and here's what I here's what I do on the code path where you're paying for the gas yourself versus someone else is paying for it. We're here, like it's in the transaction data model. Everyone uses it by default. There's not even a distinction where a smart contract knows that this was sponsored or not. It just looks the same. So I think these things do matter. I mean, I think obviously like there's a boundary and like you can't enshrine everything, but I think like there are a lot of features that are really critical for product builders that you you really do want to give that treatment to because otherwise like you'll just have a lot of, you'll have a lot of competition for something that should really just be part of the platform. Yeah, I would just add that you see that in Ethereum that a lot of features that might be either enshrined or built on chain in Solana and something like Sui are pushed off chain just because those gas fees are so high and inefficient. 
yeah. that as well. Or worse, right? It's, well, so, so, sometimes it's just very, very difficult, if not impossible to do, right? Just for NFT royalty payment. Right? Something as basic in a lot of way, right? Conceptually, you need to enforce, you need to have software to enforce the rules of you know, secondary royalties, and you can't even do that. Um, you know, I think on, in the EVM world, there's a lot of tries to come up with a new standard to adopt this. But guess what? People are still following the new standard because it's easy. Everybody's opting already. As, as opposed to the new standard, you kind of have to get everybody to agree, right? The social consensus is far harder. Uh, so you don't actually have the adoption uh, pass, right? So this is because one of those things that just sort of feel like the community just kind of give up on. Last question for me is going to be a more f- philosophical, and it's going to be, what do you hope to see in the next five years in, in crypto, right? If there's uh, if there's some levers you could pull to change uh, the trajectory or maybe the this velocity of the network, what would those be? At a very high level, I hope in five years, there are billions of people that are indirectly benefiting from the technology we're building blockchains and crypto, whatever you want to call it, Web3. Uh, it's, it doesn't make sense for the general public to be, even be aware of what blockchains are work they're using. Uh, the, this, this, this current generation of products are just not for consumers. Uh, so in five years, I hope that's the case, right? Yes, those of us work in the industry that we continue to, to care a lot about this new models, Right, new kinds of product that actually are built from the ground up, uh, are sort of you know intrinsically only possible on blockchains, right? And they 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 they're unique, they're they're exciting, right? DeFi is super exciting, and I think there's going to be many many of these examples over the next five, ten, and whatever number of years. But there's going to be a lot of you know vast majority of consumers just simply would not care. Uh, and but I but I hope you know we can touch you know we can benefit a, a very, very substantial number of them, uh, you know, hopefully in the hundreds of millions, in the billions. And I think five years is in, it's really, it's an infinity, right? In, in any kind of, uh, in, in technology terms, uh, we're, we're at the point where we cannot really kind of, uh, fall back on the excuse we're still early. Uh, and I think, you know, we're, this is a time, like this five, next five years, in my opinion, is pivotal. Whether uh, decentralized technology as a whole, not just blockchain, actually makes it, or this is becomes another thing that you know, we're not really ready for that for that shift back towards decentralization. Right? You know, we we shift a few th- times. Right? Internet started out decentralized because convenience and all that. You know, and trust issue. And we moved to a very very centralized period. Now we are in the process of moving back towards the middle, you know, if we're not successful in the next five years, you know, perhaps it's going to be a long time before that actually happens. I think for me, my uh, ambitions are really simple. It's like, I just want a proper proper product iteration and experimentation cycle. I want it to be possible for people to have like, okay, this is an idea of how I can incorporate some crypto powered element to my product. I can try it out. If it has value, great. I'm going to keep it. If not, you know, I'll iterate on it and, uh, and maybe eventually throw it out. I think that's the thing this space has really been lacking where it's like to try anything, you have to have so much conviction. Like here's this new technology. Maybe I don't even really understand it. But, like I'm going to pivot to being a blockchain game or like, you know, a tokenized asset of this sort of thing, rather than like, this is just one part of the development stack or one piece of utility that I can bring in and try it if it doesn't. And I think great things get built, usually not by someone knowing, especially with new technology, not someone knowing like, this is exactly what this is good for, but by trying a thousand things and seeing what sticks and what doesn't. And so I think if we're not seeing that by the end of the next five years, I I, I won't be very happy. But if we have that, I think there's going to be a lot of there. So it's too much focus on capturing value, uh, not enough great value created. Uh, we really need to see a balance. I mean, absolutely, we're in it, right, to do this, right? Everybody who build great products and great, great technology, they should be rewarded. Uh, but that should be rewarded because they create a lot of value uh, for the world. That's what we want to see. 
yeah, there's a lot of tribalism in the space that doesn't really need to exist. And that, that's one reason why we wanted to have you guys on, because you're like pushing the innovation forward. You're doing a lot with Move, which is new to the crypto ecosystem. We think it's really cool. And I think anybody doing that, like we want to encourage it. So uh, this is a super fun conversation. And uh, guys, thanks for coming on. Merton Garrett, thanks so much. Uh, it was our pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, definitely. We'll see you next time. All right, I've got a little ending note here. First, thank you so much for listening to the full episode. If you really liked it, hit subscribe. But secondly, make sure you sign up for DAS. This is BlockWorks' biggest institutional conference happening in London in March. I've included a link in the show notes and also a discount code. Get 20% off. Make sure to use Lightspeed20 when you sign up. All right, I'll see you there. And I'll see you next time on Lightspeed.